Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about what I think can be called a U.S. coup in Pakistan. Uh, we will see if my guest agrees. Professor Junaid Ahmad teaches religion, law, and global politics and is the director of the Center for the Study of Islam and Decoloniality in Islamabad, Pakistan. Junaid, welcome back to Talk World Radio. David, it's always a pleasure in my conversations with you. Thank you. I, I believe it's been maybe a year and a half since you were on this program on this same topic. So we clearly need an update, uh, but we should probably start with very quick background uh, for people who've been living underground uh, on Imran Khan and on recent years in, in Pakistani politics. Yeah, absolutely, David. And uh, thanks for the reminder. I think uh, I think anything over the past two years I've done with you will be about the same thing. The regime change operation that ousted former Prime Minister Imran Khan and uh, the enormous outpouring of support that followed, uh, that surprised everyone, including Imran Khan himself. Uh, so the, the oh, over a year, of protests and rallies throughout the country gave uh, a lot of people hope that, okay, this new experiment, and when I say new, it, it means it's kind of like whether in, in the U.S., if you had, yes, the traditional Republicans and the Democratic Party, and, and you had your version of those in, in Pakistan, but and maybe we'd argue over this, but I think much more corrupt here in Pakistan. And all of a sudden, the Green Party or some other makes you know some a huge uh, victory in terms of uh, you know, Congress members, maybe even president. That's exactly what it was like here in Pakistan. And I think we have to remember that that Imran Khan, this, uh, former cricketer and philanthropist uh, turned prime minister, became involved in politics, that the hope by everyone in Pakistan, everyone that wants at least some decency in the functions of the state and of government and various institutions and so on, the hope was that, the, um, am I still there, David? You are. Okay. Yeah, so the hope was that this, uh, the, this new uh, face and this new movement, the party has been called the the PTI, uh, Pakistan Tariq and Saf, and that's the Movement for Justice. And the hope and the expectation was that at least this can't get any worse than than what we've had before. And that, you know, and uh, that's why I wanted kind of our our viewers and listeners to. Uh, see what the kind of analogous situation would be in, in the United States. So it was remarkable that a, a third political party uh, could make inroads, not just inroads, but in, in, in fact become victorious uh, in, in, a, in a duopoly type of a system that's in the U.S. and in Pakistan of the traditional uh, political elites, the one, um, the Pakistan People's Party of the House of Bhutto Zardari, and the other one, the Pakistan Muslim League of uh, the Nawaz Group. And as I uh, stated in my, my recent article, I, I wasn't making any predictions what these the political uh, dispensation will that will result. But I did say that right now, the, the chief of army staff, and our viewers should know that in Pakistan, that is the most powerful. Uh, that is the most powerful uh, individual in the country. So he, uh, at this point, I mean, we can go back, but at this point, just to bring all our viewers up to date, at this point, he has effectively, you know, he's the kingmaker and he has chosen. So these elections we recently have, many of us call them general's selections. <laughs> so, and and he's chosen one of the uh, traditional uh, political parties, the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz, uh, to uh, nominate its prime minister. And of course, the only way they could do that is a, is the same way they ousted Imran Khan in the first place. Every single political party getting together, and not only that, 
plus the the military being on your side and Washington. <laughs> so Khan was up against a lot of forces. And it seems like, once again, despite the fact that his political party, which could not run on its on its political party platform, had to run as independent candidates, and they still secured the most seats in these parliamentary elections. I mean, it's truly miraculous considering the type of repression that has taken place of specifically uh, Imran Khan's party, uh, Teri Ken Saf, the repression. I mean, we, I, at least I don't remember it in my lifetime in, in Pakistan, what we saw. And it became very clear to us that the Khan virus, as I call it, uh, was really threatening to a lot of people. Now, I never thought of him as any type of revolutionary or anything like that, but in these systems, you know, even being mildly pro-democracy or pro-social justice uh, tends to get you eliminated somehow or the other. And and what are what are the policies that made him and his party so incredibly popular? Uh, is it just anti-corruption, or what? What other policies uh, are people turning out and and voting in support of, despite uh, Khan being locked up and uh, and the party being off the ballots? Well, that's the interesting, David. I often wonder myself. What's the appeal beyond, you know, is this kind of superstar and, and uh, you know, very articulate in, in his speeches and so on, that how was it possible? And like I said, I think even Khan himself was surprised after he was ousted the at the at the, just the massive scale of these rallies and protests throughout the country. The, I mean, some of the largest ones in the history. Uh, specifically in the province of uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, KPK. That is the that is the province that borders Afghanistan and where the United States for a very long time says all problems come from <laughs> on this side of the border in Pakistan. And in that uh, province, you certainly had the largest get-together rallies and protests in its history. And so, David, I, I come back to this question, you know, what has enamored the Pakistani population, particularly the youth. But I used to think that, but increasingly, it's basically, I mean, all ages, cross sections of society. And I I don't think it can be simply explained by specific policies that he implemented. Because uh, to be fair and honest, I mean, the he, whether Khan himself was perhaps well-intentioned, but, you know, a single individual can take on an entire system. And, uh, and, and so, you know, he had an idea of an Islamic welfare state. He certainly uh, provided, a good, you know, much improved social services in terms of health and education. But at the end of the day, my conclusion is this, David, that I think the people, uh, remarkably, maybe I would not be as forgiving, but the people were forgiving in some ways of Khan's term in power because they still sincerely believe that the guy himself is well-intentioned and that he's, and this is kind of my analysis as well. Politically, he's a novice, uh, naive, and, and he has had to learn the hard way <laughs> as that, that no, it's not so easy. And even the people that are with you, well, who knows where they'll go the next day, wherever the winds are blowing. So I think that because of his lack of experience in, in formal politics, I think people still genuinely see, and, and this is everyone, it's not like, you know, a couple of, this is everyone, because we know this, because that's the, the outpouring of support, the recent elections, why would they vote for this party? So I, I, I come down to this, and, and you know, maybe that's unfortunate that we continue to personalize this so much, but someone who's willing to sacrifice that much, you know, David, in the past, we have had civilian prime ministers overthrown by military coups and so on. No one was out in the streets trying to defend those prime ministers. <laughs> no one was out. For, for the ordinary person here, you know, we often talk about Pakistan, you know, going uh, from military rule to civilian rule. Honestly, David, for the ordinary pace, person, it makes no difference. It makes no difference. This is kind of an, I always call an intra-elite squabble uh, between the so-called civilian politicians and the military. And, and it's basically, we need to respect each other's piece of the pie, you know? And so it never trickles down in any way 
to the improvement of the, of the lives of, of the population. So I, I just raised that point because in the past, including the very popular, the comparisons are often made of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, you know, one of the founders of the Pakistan People's Party in the 1970s, very different from the Pakistan People's Party of today, by the way. So, you know, they, they, the rhetoric then was of uh, socialism, or Islamic socialism, that type of thing. And, and, and clearly he was a, he was a very smooth political operative. But though very intelligent in that regard, but he unfortunately had his own shortcomings. He was also power hungry. Uh, nothing like the, the the material corruption that we've had since the 1990s in terms of our civilian rule. But at the end of the day, he had alienated so many people by his authoritarianism, by relying on that same military that could have been actually checked. We should remember the Pakistani military uh, was defeated and humiliated in 70 to 71 in the uh, uh, War of Independence for East Pakistan, which became Bangladesh. That was, in my opinion, the one time where they could be just confined to their barracks and never <laughs> leave those. But uh, unfortunately, even our most popular uh, politician, Bhutto, Zulfi Ali Bhutto, even he used that same military to uh, suppress opposition, dissent, and basically dissolve uh, provincial assemblies where he had opposition. So I, I just say that because we of, this has been nothing new the, where the military is conniving with other political forces to oust someone. The only thing new and the very radically important thing that's been new in this regard is the way there's been an outpouring of support. And again, David, I, I think that both you and I, when we come down and, and look at the actual political performance of, of Rahman in power will be severely disappointed. Yeah. But I don't want to be, I don't want to have this attitude towards the people that, oh, well, you know, they're just, they're just dumb, silly, foolish, and they're, have, they're under false consciousness. No, I think it's none of that. I think there's, there's a, a, a willingness to accept the fact that Khan has, has been, was politically naive and wasn't experienced, but the guy is well-intentioned. In the past, when our prime ministers were ousted, Immediately, they'll run to Dubai, Saudi Arabia, London, and that's fine for the military. Okay, that's great. Just you can leave the country. Khan right. refused. He said, yeah, I'm not going anywhere. So it, that's inspiring to many people. Junaid, uh, 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 the, 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 the popularity, the public support is different, but also it's not a traditional military coup. There's a number of different uh, tactics from assassination attempts to prosecutions and imprisonment that have been used here. When I, when I call it a U.S.-backed coup, is that fair? Is that accurate? And, and what do we know about the U.S. role? Well, I think it's very accurate. Now, one can debate how much was this really, uh, or to what extent was this sought by Washington alone or also by domestic political actors? Certainly, the, the one factor that, of course, uh, unfortunately, many of our friends and comrades in, in Pakistan were not willing to acknowledge was that the, the chief of army staff and the military high command were also behind it. And because at the time, the way the, the actual uh, ousting from power happened is through a what's called a, a vote of no confidence in parliament. That once you uh, your own party members are leaving your party and you don't get the sufficient votes to have a parliamentary majority, you can have a vote of no confidence and, and you'll have to step down. Now, the interesting thing is, coming back to the American role, and men, many of our viewers uh, will probably know this, but there was a famous, a famous cipher, uh, an official diplomatic cable, that was sent from the Pakistani ambassador to the U.S. to the Pakistan Foreign Ministry. In it, it uh, basically conveys the details of a me of their of the meeting between the Pakistani ambassador to the U.S. and an assistant secretary of state, uh, Donald Liu of the United States. And in that meeting, and of course, I mean, poor Donald Liu. I don't want to pick on him. Of course, he's representing the views of the White House and the State Department because it's been very funny how his name is just everywhere now. He's a very popular guy in Pakistan. Just tell him not to come here. And so he uh, basically conveyed to, ha uh, to the ambassador that, look, uh, we really don't like this character Khan and his role in the Russia and Ukraine. 
uh, conflict. Because what, <laughs> what disastrously happened to Khan was that he was arriving in Moscow the day when they launched their special military operation in Ukraine. Now, I often ask people, like, and because immediately he got, uh, you know, contacted by everyone in, in the West and his own, uh, the generals were also saying, look, there's a lot of pressure. You have to condemn Putin right there. Now, I would ask anyone if they would have the courage to be <laughs> meeting Putin and then condemn him, maybe from afar. But no, it was ridiculous. I mean, he was going there for cheap wheat, uh, cheap gas and all those things. But the fact that he didn't denounce him while shaking his hand uh, perturbed many people. And in, and so it's this bizarre term they use. We do not like his aggressive neutrality. <laughs> it seems right. like an oxymoron, but that's exactly what Assistant Secretary of State said to the Pakistani ambassador, who was dumbfounded. What is this guy saying? Khan is not picking a position or anything. But I, I, I raise this point also to... Um, point out that this was probably the you know the last straw that bo broke the camel's back because there were a whole set of grievances uh, that made Washington irate from Khan's desire to have an independent foreign policy, his uh, uh, outspoken uh, support for the Palestinians, for Kashmiris, uh, all, all sorts of things. David, we have to realize that we, particularly in the post 9-11 world, in the Muslim majority world, in the Arab world, Middle East, we have been living in an era, and of course it precedes 9-11 uh, as well, in which the United States has controlled all of these Muslim despots, despots and, and they've been accountable to no one but, you know, Washington and, and so on. So I think that this is why Khan emerges as this uh, superstar in the Muslim world, not because he's so revolutionary, it's just that there's no one like him at this point, really. It's it's still remarkable that the crime is is neutrality, that uh, not supporting either side of a war is unacceptable. You have to support the proper side, the, the side that Washington tells you to support. Uh, here I am living in the United States, more or less free and opposing both sides in every way I can. Uh, right. But if you're running a country uh, somewhere in the world, you must support the U.S. side and oppose only the Russian side. Uh, you know, neutral. But, but David, here's the interesting thing. Here's the interesting thing. The very close allies, like India, also decided to be remain neutral. And, can, and you know, despite all of these sanctions on Russia, you would think that India, which is very close to the United States, part of all sorts of uh, different uh, uh, treaties and so on, it. Uh, has remained not only remained neutral, it has continued to openly buy gas uh, and oil from Russia. You know, so the, the interesting thing is, so there's no pressure on the Indian government, but they consider Pakistan such a satrapy, such it's you know it's a protectorate of, of Washington that they can just have their viceroys uh, there dictate exactly how we should operate in Pakistan. And of course, we I can't blame Washington; they've had servile uh, and docile and obedient military leaders and civilian leaders. So this was something new for, for Washington. And so, I mean, just what you were saying, you're right. It's, it's not only not been traditional in the sense that once Khan was ousted, there's this huge momentum of, of support uh, throughout the country, but it's also the way they have continuously targeted Khan. And again, I mean, maybe it's They've been very um, incompetent in this regard. That's, you know, my, my view. And I think that it's, at some point, even Washington has realized that uh, because before there was silence, silence on this diplomatic cable called the cipher. We didn't do it, etc. When The Intercept finally published the contents of that cipher, verified by everyone, and even not just Washington denied it, even our military establishment here. What Khan is crazy. He's, he's making all this stuff up. It's published by The Intercept. Now, the State Department is like, you, I remember the spokesman, now at this point, he's not even in denial mode. It's more like, well, this is normal behavior between governments. So this is normal talk. Yeah, normal talk is if you oust your prime minister, all will be forgiven. That's what the assistant said. I don't, I'm not sure if that's really normal <laughs> between countries. And the military high command, which in the first place denied that this ever existed, Khan's a nutcase, et cetera. 
then realized it was leaked, tried to ban the intercept. But, you know, in this day and age, you know, these, these things can't happen. And all of a sudden, perfect for them. Now we're going to charge Khan for treason. For for leaking an official document that's a that poses a threat to national security, go figure. And so uh, you, you, you're absolutely right. It's it's the ouster. They thought that would do it. Plan A, Plan B, bring up some cases against him. He'll be in the courts. No, it doesn't work. Plan C is what you pointed out: assassination. Maybe they should have done that at the beginning. Two attempts failed. After that, it comes all of these bogus uh, charges of uh, terrorism, treason, etc. And he's jailed, isolated. No. Yet the party still wins <laughs> big time. But it wasn't treason against the Pakistani government or the Pakistani people. If anything, it was treason against the U.S. government, which is, you know, what they're prosecuting an Australian publisher in Julian Assange for treason against the U.S. government when... He's not from the U.S., so it seems you can be guilty of this crime no matter where you are. Absolutely. I'm glad you raised the um, case of Julian Assange as well. I mean, I think that many of our well-meaning uh, comrades here did, wanted to pretend maybe, because many of them, you know, uh, disliked Khan and and thought that Khan was stealing, as Bismarck, <laughs> Khan was stealing the socialist thunder from, from the socialists here. So I, I think that they were willing to give credence to the fact that, well, this is a very parliamentary way in which we've uh, gotten rid of Khan. And only months later, they had to kind of go quiet because everything that Khan was saying <laughs> proved to be correct, that in fact, Washington was, was behind it, that in fact, the chief of army staff in collusion with both Washington as well as the kleptocratic politicians here was also behind it. So, I mean, at the time I said that, look, you know, I'm not saying that what Khan is saying is the confirmed truth, but I'm saying that also don't expect for the United States or the CIA to leave a paper trail of exactly how we're going to <laughs> That's never happened. We find out later, actually. Oh, sometimes they do. Sometimes they do. Yeah, sometimes they do. Sometimes we're lucky. Uh, you, but but you know I was very audio. naive. Yeah, we got audio. Tapes. We got audio tapes on Ukraine before it happens. So you know sometimes uh, it's pretty blatant. Uh, but so what's going to happen now? Is he going to remain in prison? Uh, his party has won the elections, but they don't get to be in charge, even though they won the elections. What what happens next? Right. I think the one takeaway from this, David, is that the party not so much i mean not everyone that's supportive of of khan and 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 this movement is necessarily part of the party although beyond my expectations many are still <laughs> still behind the party i mean it's remarkable these are people that have been imprisoned tortured forced to renounce politics at least half of the leadership that's how the military establishment here operates it blackmail it blackmails you it goes after your families all of these things the military intelligence apparatus here so it was very understandable when people say that oh you know all these people left many of them good people well if you're going to you know their families and all of that it's understandable why uh they would have. so this this victory the most seats in parliament happens despite all of this happening for more than a year david and, the, and the, the military high command and the new chief of army staff, perhaps the most hated in the Pakistan's country and in, in the history of Pakistan. And as I said in my article, there's no shortage of competition there. But but he, along with the, uh, um, he had assured Washington and his principal kind of finance here, the uh, House of Sharif, one of the political parties, Pakistan Muslim, that, look, I've eliminated this party, PTI. They can't even run on PTI. I've, a couple of them will run as independents. He failed miserably. <laughs> Even as independents, they won the majority of the seats. So that is miraculous. That is, I, mean, I would never have expected this. No one expected this. And this is why uh, even now, just now, we finally hear the State Department come out with a pretty good, uh, you know, harsh cr criticisms of these elections uh, and so on. So many members of co Congress now raising concerns. Some are you know, really denouncing the way the military has interfered in this. One wonders where were they before, but I think they, I think this is a general sense. I, I mean, I think that many of the particularly Democratic uh, members of Congress, including Representative Ilan Umar, who had met with Imran Khan, I'm sure they wanted to say something earlier, but they were just taking their cues from the Democratic Party leadership uh, in the White House and in Congress. 
And I think now they now now they felt a bit free to, because I think that uh, by this point, you know, Washington is like our State Department's phone, our White House phone has been lying for you guys for this long, and still you don't <laughs> deliver our results. So everyone is is kind of caught with their hands down in in this situation, and and so what has happened now is, of course, uh, as I said, that the chief of army staff, it's he's no longer thinking about big picture stuff. He's thinking about how to save himself. And so he goes to the, the party that financed him, Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz Group, the House of Sharif. And lo and behold, I, I guess my my very teeny tiny prediction came, <laughs> came became correct. He uh, has basically had uh, one of the Sharif brothers become the prime minister. And I think the uh, the daughter of, of one of the former prime minister, Nawaz Sharif, maybe and the chief minister of Punjab. So I, I was expecting this. But the takeaway, David, is that clearly uh, there is a massive movement which actually represents the will of the people. And uh, let's see what, what how they're going to suppress this. I, I personally think, uh, and I'm not the only one, that this is such a major victory for, for that movement that despite all the rigging, elections, repression, et cetera, they can still do it. I, David, this is Pakistan. This is where the military intelligence, they control who wins, who doesn't. And they broke through that. So that's that's inspiring. That's motivating. We've got less than two minutes left, and I want to ask about your own situation. Are you safe? Or is everyone happy with the way you are talking about the Pakistani government? Well, David, I think that uh, we've been allowed a, a small window to to let let's see how long this lasts. Uh, so I want to thank uh, our friends at the State Department and the <laughs> National Security Council for also getting the courage to criticize. Because now and, and of course this has been my criticism of of the Pakistani media as well, including like our most well respected uh, uh, newspaper uh, Dawn, that they just buckled under pressure th throughout this entire period. Now they're talking about the the democratic will expressing itself, defying the powers that be. And I was like, wow, I wish you guys could have done this two years, a year, six months, three months before when actually the the, the people needed your coverage and, and reporting. So it's clear that we've found a window to, to talk about all these things. And that's why I said, if, if it's coming from Washington, and it's unfortunate because it does seem like some of our newspapers uh, turn to Washington to see what they can and can't say, not even to our military workers, <laughs> because it's all of a sudden you you see that. So now it's it's not so difficult, but of course we we have to be cautious. It's it's always incredible the influence Washington has on other countries, where the people supposedly represented by the U.S. government here in the U.S. Eh, mostly don't have a clue what's going on. Um, we've got to, we've got to inform ourselves. Uh, Junaid Ahmad, thank you for everything you're doing. I hope you stay safe and keep doing it. Uh, and thanks again for coming on Talk World Radio. Thanks so much, David. As always, it's a delight and a pleasure. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.